Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Jolly, and uh, thanks for joining us. We, we are so honored to have with us today three men who have truly earned their citizenship. And uh, we're so honored to have them here. You know, uh, to quote our, our great chair, Miss Judy, this year sucked. And I want to welcome these guys because they know what it means to survive in a world where a financial downturn has just taken place. They know what it means to live in a world that is at war with a common enemy. They know what it means to rise above and to overcome adversity. And more importantly, they know what it means to rebuild a homeland that is in turmoil. These are all lessons that we can learn. And between them all, 275 years of life experience here today. So we're honored to have with them. Absolutely. <laughs> they shared this with me earlier today, but along the way, if I can speak frankly with you, they've all learned how to kick some serious ass. They've all wiped a few, some of whom are here today. And uh, they've all learned from uh, some definite chewings. So, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Please welcome, if you will, uh, Colonel Bud Anderson. There he is. Do you remember that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, look at that. Right Colonel Anderson, the pilot of Old Crow, a triple ace in World War II, flew, of course, in Korea and in Vietnam, and he's here with us today. Our, our next honored guest down here at the very end is uh, none other than Colonel Charles McGee. He's a Tuskegee Airman. <laughs> Holds the record. 409 combat missions, not just missions, 409 combat missions, and he's joined us here today. His son is here, who was also an F-4 pilot, and as you'll learn later on today, they both flew F-4s in Vietnam. Now, the only working man here today, Mr. Cy Campbell. He was a warrant officer and a tail gunner on Lancaster Bombers, member of the Royal Canadian Air Force, and as you can see today, he's a member of the Royal Canadian Legion. We're honored to have you here, Cy, as well as your, your family. I, I want to rewind to the start of the war, and I want to talk to each of you about becoming a warrior. In our culture today, I think it's lost. My wife is a squadron commander at Keesler Air Force Base, and we see these new airmen that come in all the time, and they're focused on tech training, they're focused on all of this other stuff, and hearing uh, a retired chief who I talked to last week, he said, you know, Matt, we're missing the warrior culture. You guys know what it means to be a warrior. And I want you to talk about that. Talk about your training. I want to start with, with Colonel McGee because the Tuskegee Airmen, your training, we all know about. But I, I want you to tell us a little bit about what it was like to be down there at Mooton Field in Tuskegee, Alabama back then. Well, I think it's important to know that we lived through, uh, I call it a 10-year period that kind of gives everybody's life a focus. We came out of 10 years of depression. Our company declared war. There was opportunity in the industry for work. There were those, all of us wanting to participate to, as we wanted to support our allies in Europe. That attitude uh, or that circumstance changed our attitude so that we were ready to participate. It didn't, segregation still existed, but yet we were all supporting the war effort. And uh, that makes a big difference of what your attitude is. Mm. Each and every one of you stepped up to the plate. Absolutely. <laughs> Even for a country that didn't know if you could do it. Well, you they didn't kept believe it, but that was based on some biases and generalizations. Um, once they gave us opportunity to prove herself, uh, they found out <coughs> something different, although some of the minds didn't change immediately. Mm. It took a little while. But the record is there for them to see that, uh, you know, ability doesn't come in happenstance of birth. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> well, you flew Stearman's down there, then you flew BT-13's. That was getting into training. Uh, well, that was the other thing. They didn't have to change the standard of training. Hmm. We were able to meet that standard. BT-17, BT-13, BT AT-6, F-40. Uh, well, we call them P-40s then, right. and later fighters. Uh, 
we were able to measure up once given the opportunity to go through the training. And uh, I guess, well, the record speaks for itself. Absolutely. And at what point did you realize that you were a warrior down there? Well, I had gone through some ROTC training, so I had some idea, a bit of knowledge of what war was about. But to uh, stand up with those uh, Army Air Corps silver wings on your breast and uh, second lieutenant bars pinned on your shoulder and stood a little bit taller and realized that uh, <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we're in this fight as well as everybody else. Well, thanks for being here today. Thank you for that. I want to ask Colonel Anderson the same question. You trained at a little place better known as Luke Army Airfield, I guess, Luke Air Force Base today, uh, where you uh, learned how to become a warrior yourself. I'll ask you the same question, bud. When, when did you realize what you would be doing in the lethality of it all? I think I realized I was a warrior uh, later in my career during peacetime. Hmm. Peacetime, you don't need warriors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd rather address that question about what about warriors and the philosophy of warriors and things like that as beginning of World War II <coughs> and how our nation responded to, um, to the war. And uh, I can remember, as a matter of fact, uh, thinking about the RAF, we had young men that got into the war they went to Canada to get into the war mm -hmm. to go over there and help Britain versus Vietnam, where our men, young men, went to Canada to avoid the war. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once Pearl Harbor was attacked, our young men rushed to the recruiting offices, I mean in swarms. And uh, there was just that will to do it, to, to help our country. You know, the old saying, what can you do for your country? Not what the country can do for you was a, uh, was a thing then. And uh, that's what I think about the warrior concept is a desire of the people that are going to do it. You got you to gotta have it in here somewhere. And, um, and you kind of you kinda had to want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember that as a, as a, as a member of a squadron. Uh, the warriors, you could tell the difference. And uh, we had young men there that were doing their duty, but just doing that. Some of them didn't belong there, <laughs> but they were doing their duty. And uh, then there were some of the warriors that maybe were doing just a little extra. I want to turn the question out aside. I had lunch just now with your family. Here's a man that got all the way into the back end of a Lancaster bomber. And he grabbed a hold of those guns and he said, come on, boys, where are you? A real Rambo up here. And he's, he's the young one in the bunch. But uh, I, I want to talk to you about that because that, that had to be a, a, a real tough moment. You flew. 30 plus missions in the back of a Lancaster. And for those of you who don't know, the average lifespan of a Lancaster gunner was what, seven missions? Yeah, pretty well. When did you realize in training what you were up against and what kept you going forward? I guess um, when you think of it on it along that line, that you always thought that it was never going to happen to you. Uh, I think if you thought that it was going to happen to you, you would go, uh, you'd run out the back door someplace, you know. Mm. But <laughs> no, I don't think that really entered into it, uh, really. I know uh, I had a brother that uh, he was a rear gunner uh, and was killed just shortly after I got in the forces. He was shot down over Holland and is buried in Holland and uh, my other brother was in ground crew served in a fighter squadron but looking after Spitfire aircraft 
But no, I don't think it really entered into the facts at all because it was never going to happen to you. You were young and invincible. Yes, yeah, I think so. Didn't know any better, right. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask his kids, he still is. <laughs> I joined up. Uh, uh, I was in the hospital in uh, 1942 when my brother that was killed overseas uh, on came his to say goodbye. On his seventh mission, I might add. Uh, no, I was, yeah. uh, no, he was a little while after that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but and your brother was, was on his seventh mission. Yeah. The, yeah. Right. Uh, he came to see me in the hospital before he, uh, w just when he was on his way overseas mm. and said goodbye. And uh, I said, I'll see you over there. Yeah. But I didn't quite make it in time. Yeah. That's the way it goes. That's the reality of it all. <laughs> that's the reality. Yeah. And that's why we have that table over there. Yeah. We can talk about combat. We can talk about shooting down our watches, and we will. In my day job with Warbird Radio, I fail if that's all I ask these guys about. So I want to turn the tables just a little bit, because if we miss the life lessons, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> you, you fight because you love. You fight because you love this country, because you love your families, because you love peace and freedom. I want you to share a a story with us. Bud, I want to start with you. You, you really saw some, some terrible stuff up there. We all know that. But I want you to tell the story about the time that you saw that ME-109, that BF-109, come right up. And you saw that guy in his eyes before you had to pull the trigger. Can you mm -hmm. tell that story? Which one was that? This is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a real triple ace, huh? <laughs> uh, you know the one. It goes oh, like want, this. Oh, you want yeah. that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be here all uh, night, folks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, this story takes a long time. Well, we and, got time. And um, uh, uh, the, the event was on the History Channel in the dogfight series, and I don't know, it's just 15 minutes, something like that, telling the total story. And it's a lot easier to watch that because they had the uh, things that, but, but I have to do this manually. That's all right, we're set up, yeah. we're an analog kind of crowd <laughs> today. Uh, so then, yeah. Yeah. Fighter pilots cannot <laughs> yeah, talk without using their hands. You know, <laughs> if I had to do this, I could not tell you this story. <laughs> uh, my most exciting dogfight, I guess you would call it, uh, a very successful one. Uh, in the spring of uh, 1944, uh, deep into Germany, and uh, we were escorting um, B-17s, and I was on the close escort where you, s where you uh, stay in close to the bombers. And this was after Jimmy Doolittle gave us the order that once they were attacked, you know, you follow them and kill them. And uh, so uh, we're, uh, I got a flight of four. The bombers are going in this stream and we're doing uh, 45 degree, 90 degree turns here, trying to keep our speed up because the bombers are so slow. And we hear on the radio that uh, they're being attacked up front. So we make kind of a steep turn and I'm in the second section and we're going, we're going to go up front, see what the heck's mm. going on. And about that time, I thought, uh oh, we're, we're making a good turn. It's a good time to check your rear, you know, look around behind. My wingman, who's on the inside of me, immediately calls out, hey, we got four bogeys coming at us from five o'clock high. We're in this steep turn. Five o'clock is right here. We're very vulnerable. And they weren't bogeys. Bogeys were unidentified airplanes. I spotted them immediately. There was four ME-109s in trail coming right down our tail. Mm -hmm. I mean, perfect setup. Well, we saw them in time, so I made a, a won't say violent turn, but... <laughs> <laughs> Charles May. <laughs> <laughs> Being a flight leader, you have yeah. to consider your flight, you know, <laughs> but it was a very tight turn to go <laughs> head on with them. That's, that's your defensive maneuver. We went right through them. This is that, by the way, at the, 
uh, well above 25,000 feet, 20, 27, 28, 29 in there somewhere. And uh, so we go head on with them. Nobody could get a shot, it was so quick. They string out like that and we're going this way and I look back and they turn left. I thought they would go down and attack the bombers and, and then leave. But that meant to me they're after us. They had attacked us and they decided they're gonna get us. So uh, they had a lot of speed and they started that turn. And by that time I got my flight in string, one, two, three, four, and we started a big left-hand turn up there at high altitude, right at the altitude where the Mustang can perform with a two-stage, two-speed supercharger. We were in good shape. And these, in, these uh, were ME-109Gs, ME their best high altitude fighter. So we go around a couple of times. We're directly across from them. Then the next time I'm coming around, I, yeah. I'm getting closer to them. They see this. They roll out and run level, didn't dive. They run level uh, back toward Germany. So we roll out, follow them. And the number four guy does something really weird. <laughs> He's climbs away like this. We're, ch we're chasing the Messerschmitts this way. Well, I didn't want to get too far up where he could drop down on me, so I sent my number three and four man, Eddie Simpson, told me, you go after him, we'll go after the three. He did, and he shot him down and joined up later. So now we got three of Messerschmitts and two, two um, Mustangs right behind. The last guy, if you want to shoot somebody down, the best way you do it is to get into what we call a six o'clock position. You got a target out there, you drive straight up, straight up his tail and uh, get within 300 yards, give him a burst and that's it. That's exactly what I did. We had uh, a speed advantage over them and I closed in 300 yards, fired, got hits all over it. Then the guy does something really weird. He, he must have been an air show pilot. Probably so. <laughs> yeah. I just thought that yeah, out. Yeah, well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Very young. Yeah. 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 And right. he, he rolls over, inverted, oh, yeah. at, at, okay. at altitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here very comfortable, right side up. And he's smoking like crazy already. And I thought, what the heck's he doing? You know, if he was going to roll over, he just split S right there and, and try to get away. So I don't care. I'm sitting there comfortably right side up, give him another burst, and that took him out. And he, he really went on down. Now they got two up there, and they're skidding around trying to look behind. Uh, uh, and uh, so um, they d one of them decides to roll over and split us down, the other guy takes a hard left turn, very hard. By that time, I'm, I'm coming fast here. He kills a lot of his speed in this climbing left turn. So what I did, I said, well, I'll just cut. I, I thought about pulling the throttle back and getting inside of him, but I didn't want to lose all that energy. Then they might get around on me. So I said, well, I'll cut across his path, pull my airplane up like this, and look back and see what he does, hoping he's going to run, and then I'll just drop on his tail. Well, as I pull up with the wingman, he reverses his turn and comes over here and tries to come after us. Now, he's lost a lot of energy. He made this turn, and he made this turn, and now he's pulling up. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, well, we're doing pretty good, but, uh, you know, I don't... I don't you don't like it when somebody's behind you with a machine gun. <laughs> so I, I'm looking back, and I see him all of a sudden kind of move over this way. That meant he's going after my wingman. So I called John Scarrow, and I says, hey, he's, he's on your tail. You take, take it down and do some evasive action, and I'll cover you. I thought John might have thought, I wonder if he's using me for bait here. <laughs> <laughs> but. The guy was really after him, so John took it down, the Mr. Smith goes down, and I dropped right on his tail, mm -hmm. uh, out of range, long ways. The guy saw it right away. 
and he straightens out, goes again. He's, we're separated pretty good. He makes us another hard turn like this. Uh, well, I out-zoomed him last time. I think I'll try it again. I cut across, pulled up, look back, see what he's going to do. Uh-oh, he reverses his turn. Now he's coming after me. Well, I still felt pretty good because he lost a lot of energy when he, but when he does this maneuvering. Um, but he's pulling up, and we're just kind of going like this. And he, he's got to get his nose up here to lead me. I'm thinking about plan B, too, because I look back there. I can close my eyes, and I can <laughs> see the nose of that uh, Messerschmitt where that big cannon fires right through the um, uh, hub, hub of the propeller. And uh, so uh, uh, I might have had a few prayers in there, too, and then all of a sudden I see what I'm looking for, and he starts mushing around like this, and then he had to kick it over. He couldn't. He stalled. That put me right back on his tail. We go down again. He comes around in another hard turn, just like the. And uh, I thought, well, um, I didn't want to be up on top again. I didn't want to give him another opportunity to uh, chase me. So I said, I think I'll, I think I'll try to get inside of him. It was a little bit different. It wasn't quite this way. It was more this way. So I suck it in like this, and sure enough, I see I'm going to make it. And he's looking back, too. And he kind of screwed up in a way. He straightened out, and then he probably thought that I'd come off on the power to make this tight turn. And then he straightened out. That solved my angle off. And then he pulls it up, hoping he can out-zoom me. Well, I had that old Mustang. You know, it was firewalled from, day, from right from the beginning of this thing. And I just pulled up, he's, he's pulling up straight like this, and I pulled up inside of him mm -hmm. and uh, got here, got a little scene, got a sight picture, fired a little burst, saw a tracer go off his left wing, so to speak, and um, said, okay, I'll just give a little left rudder, get it, get it neutral, get it good, good in trim, fired another burst, and it hit him all over the center of the airplane, wing roof, cockpit, everything. He's going straight up now, and I quit firing and coasted right up to him, and the propeller was just windmilling, and he, I was right on his wing, just pulled up on this. I could see the grease in the wheel well and all the rivets closely. The cockpit was full of smoke, and from there, he just kind of rolled over like this from, I don't know, 28, 29,000 feet, and just went straight down. And um, it was a bright, bright day. I mean, just uh, um, at noon. And he's going down. He went down through 20,000 feet, and I'm following him. It's, it's faster than I'd ever been in my life, going too fast. So I come off the throttle, started a big orbit to follow him, and just in case he was, you know, would, would pull out and try to run on the deck, he was, he was gone already. And all of a sudden, I see his shadow way out here, and I see this big smoke column. Must have been two miles long. And they finally emerged together in a tremendous explosion. And uh, it, was a, it was an incredible feeling that, um, you know, that you'd survived. When, when we got into this one-on-one, -on -one, it was pretty obvious uh, somebody was going to die. And uh, if you're so pumped up with adrenaline, uh, trying to survive yourself. And then when you do, it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And so uh, we pu pulled off from that, got my flight back together, found the bombers, and it was a pretty tremendous day. We'd been attacked by four ME-109s, turned the tables on them, shot down three of them, left one to go home and tell a, tell a story. And uh, that was probably my most exciting experience in World War II. You know, teamwork. <laughs> there you go. Teamwork's what it's all about. You said oh, you joined yeah. up with your flight to protect those bombers. I, I want to talk to Sia a little bit because you were in those bombers. You were the guy they were 
They were flying after to protect. <laughs> you had all the goods. Yes. What's that old story about fighter pilots getting all the glory, huh? Well, <laughs> this, is your, this is your few seconds. <laughs> Tell us about a mission being in the back of that airplane. Had to be lonely back there, but you had your crew. <laughs> yes. Talk to us about that, that feeling to be a part of crew life and to not be all alone like Bud was talking about. Well, first of all, let me say I'm, uh, I'm very humbled to be sitting between two guys here that were fighter aircraft pilots, mm -hmm. which was really something. Uh, I thought uh, during the Battle of Britain there when uh, Churchill made his famous song about everybody knows what he said, uh, but the amount of uh, the, uh, I don't know how you'd put it, the amount of uh, fighting the uh, fighter pilots did to save Britain at that time and did get a great amount of credit for it, mm. really, as the years went by. Uh, compared to myself, who I flew 36 trips over enemy territory, I was a rear gunner, yes. Uh, uh, you, uh, you didn't see what was coming up, uh, and I often thought that uh, I'm sure glad that I wasn't a nose gunner because I'd have probably <laughs> ran for the tail <laughs> turret. To, uh, when you <laughs> because uh, when you look out and see nothing sure. but flak, like uh, the German uh, anti-aircraft uh, fire was very, very uh, accurate. They called it predicted flak, where they had uh, uh, their uh, searchlights at night were coincided with their anti-aircraft guns, and they would hook on to you, and they could tell how fast you were flying and how high you were, and. Uh, and if you got caught in a searchlight, uh, then the predicted flak took over and is sure. very accurate. We, uh, uh, and that was pretty scary. We got hold uh, a few times and you could hear the flak rattling off the skin of the aircraft. And, and uh, one time that we were away and we saw both front lines that night, uh, we were uh, uh, almost 10 hours uh, in flight. Uh, we were diverted to an American bomber uh, place that night, uh, um, airfield, uh, because uh, we were up in northern England in the Yorkshire, and uh, we were nothing to get fogged in and couldn't land. And uh, we, uh, when we uh, got off the main runway and were going to taxi to a dispersal area to leave our aircraft, we ran out of gas. But, uh, so that gets <laughs> a little bit scary. Uh, and uh, so flying at night was, was uh, quite a thing. Uh, I did daylight trips too. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite the thing to be flying along and look down and uh, there'd be a squadron of... Uh, Flying Fortresses, or B-17s, I guess they were, uh, flying along down there, and we were flying along up here. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it was and you, you also said that, that your airplane sounded a lot better than those American airplanes, with those four yes. Merlins well, I, screaming yes. through the sky, as you said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing uh, that really hits your heart when you hear four Merlin motors all in synchronization. Yeah, beautiful. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Colonel McGee and the kitten, huh? <laughs> oh, boy, it's going to give old Crow a run for its money. I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing this. Now, part of the Tuskegee Airmen, you're flying the kitten, the red-tailed kitten. He called his wife the kitten, and he said his, his crew chief kept it running like a kitten. Purr, purr. Purred like a kitten. <laughs> tell, yeah. us, tell us about a give – us, give us a tale in the kitten. Well, uh, it was – we put a name on there that had its meaning, but uh, I said put the name on both sides, one for my wife and the other for my crew chief, because he was very much responsible for uh, me 
flying safely. I think in all of my missions, I had only one early return, and, and that, that meant a lot. But it was good to have a name on there uh, because that's, like I say, we were flying for our country and, and the folks back home, and that was a way of keeping close, even though mail was awful slow. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you're featured in the Red Tails uh, Rise Above movie yeah. uh, that, that travels the country today, telling the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and inspiring these kids to rise above. Now, your son is here. Yeah. Both of you flew F-4s in Vietnam. That's right. I had gone uh, to, I was flying the reconnaissance version. Mm -hmm. He was flying the fighter version. Uh, I was based in Thailand. I was in Vietnam doing tactical reconnaissance. And so that was quite a, an experience. But, but the whole family was involved, really. He had in fighters, I in fighters. I had a brother who was a signal officer. Mm. My father was a chaplain and uh, had a sister who was went in Army Corps. So uh, a bit of history there for the family in, into what it means to, to me really be an American and realize that we've got our country problems, but uh, nobody can beat us. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to have some mentoring lessons, if that's all right. Get your notebooks out. Your son told me that I had to ask you about the four Ps. Oh. Would you share that with us? I'd be glad to, because I think this is something everybody can use, and I hope everybody out there is monitoring a young person coming along behind, because as I tell them and, and like to share uh, the red-tailed story with the youngsters, say, and I often say, you know why it's good important rather that you do good in school. I mm. said, you are America's tomorrow. What you're doing, what's going, what's taking place 20 years from now is going to be what you're doing. But with what I'd like to pass on and, and pass on, then there are four P's that are so important. And yet it also comes out of the Tuskegee experience. Uh, the first P is perceive. You know, dream your dreams, but while you're doing it, find out what you like to do and what your talents are. Second P, prepare. Get an education. We need to broaden that, though, to be sure you read, write, and speak well, and also be some science and math and the other, other things. And along this thing, uh, the third P is, is perform. Let excellence be the goal in everything you're doing. Don't mm. stand short. Be up front. And finally, uh, the fourth P would be persevere. Don't let circumstances be an excuse for not achieving. Mm. I think that's something we can pass on to all of our youngsters. Uh, and, and it's a challenge in them. Their challenge may be a little different, but the requirements don't change. Prepare seek excellence, and of course I'd add to that, we talk about sometimes, what's your attitude? Yeah, attitude is everything, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, In this business, sometimes it's uh, altitude. I want to bring that up because the room of people that you're looking at inspire millions each year at air shows, and they are mentors. They were my heroes growing up, and today, as we sit here in this room, I want you to tell them and maybe we can address this to Sai as well. I, I, maybe you should start this off since your grandson is here. Uh, your, your two daughters are here, one daughter-in-law and one son. The other son couldn't be here. What's important about mentoring? This is something that, that about we what? all do, but it, what's important about mentoring? Give us a mentoring lesson that, that you lived by, that you believe is important. Well, I've said that, and I've said to my kids really I don't really care what you do in life but be happy when you go to work in the morning uh, I can never ever see working at a job through your whole life and going to more mm. to work in the morning and detesting the day that you're going to have to go to work I think life is too short to to put yourself through that torture for the rest for all of your life at working at something that that you hate. Simple as that. 
Well, none of us are in this for the money, I can assure you. Isn't that right? Oh. <laughs> Especially this year. <laughs> but, oh, oh. But, uh, Colonel Anderson, you, you were, uh, we've had you on the show so many times, I have to remember what I want to ask you, but you, you led a, a team during test pilot school, you, you're, uh, during test pilot phase of your career. Uh, you later went on to work in, in the private sector and, and continued building teams and, and being a leader. That falls under mentoring. I want you to, to, to tell us, what, what do we need to be doing to be good leaders from your perspective? What, uh, I'm sorry? To be a good leader from your perspective. Tell, tell us what we need to do. Well, uh, the, the lessons I learned, um, I was forced into a position of leadership at a very early age. Um, I flew all my combat at age 22. Uh, two tours, uh, about 500 hours of combat, and um, leadership in battle is one thing. You know, leadership running a, com a company is different. But um, I found that you had to lead by example. You had to be able to do what you ask your people to do. Um, in, in a wartime thing. And uh, uh, lead by example. And then the thing that I tell young people too is, is that you can be what you want to be. Uh, hmm. You're looking at at least one and probably three people that lived their boyhood dreams. I certainly did to the maximum. And uh, aviation was a passion to me, and it still is. And uh, if you can find a, live your dreams, uh, the three Ps is, is, a, is good. Uh, but find something that you can do, and if you love your job and you, and you, and you can do a good job, uh, things seem to fall in place a lot, a lot easier for you. Um, those are probably my thoughts on that subject. We're going to come back to that in just a second. You know, part of being a good leader is being a good follower. You have to learn how to follow before you can lead. Isn't that the truth? You've got to learn what you're doing before That's you right. can exemplify it. Got to be a wingman first. Got to be a wingman. <laughs> Boy, I hear that every day. <laughs> I heard that a little bit last night, too, down at the Round Bar, but I won't mention oh. names. <laughs> you know, uh, I talked to each of you. We're running out of time, but I talked to each of you beforehand. I said, I want you to give me one quality from life that you think is important. Just one. Okay, yeah. Sai said laughter. Charles McGee said, stay positive. positive and Colonel Anderson said that he had no minor vices. <laughs> Man's never had a touch of alcohol the whole time in the war. Always, always drank water and lemon in the fighter bar. You mean just since he got here? Yeah, just since oh. he got here. <laughs> <laughs> There's the laughter. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> diminish your reputation there, but no. <laughs> Tell me about staying positive, Colonel McGee. Positive attitude is so important to me in leadership because if you're looking at it, you need to understand negative, but you don't focus on it because it takes your thoughts and the life away from what the target really is. So a positive attitude, I feel, I think it was a song maybe some of the folks here remember uh, it goes, goes way back that accentuate the positive eliminate the negative oh, and yeah. don't mess with Mr. In Between that's right <laughs> Cy tell me about laughter <laughs> laughter is important about what? tell me about laughter because this is important Cy has been lucky twice he's married to a beautiful lady they have a wonderful family and, and unfortunately, she passed away, and, and yet you fell in love again, and laughter has carried you through how many years of marriage now in family? Oh, boy. That's kind of, oh, I'm sorry you asked that question. Uh, 
Irene and I, we <laughs> yeah, we even forgot Math our first. public. <laughs> Irene and I, we even forgot our first anniversary. Like yeah, um, yes. Uh, I was in the Bank of Montreal in the little town of Unity, Saskatchewan, which is north of Montana. Uh, the other Wait, day, there's, there's a country up there. Is that what you <laughs> yes. said? Yes. <laughs> yes. No yeah. Well, yeah. they had to put something <laughs> south of the border yeah. from Saskatchewan. Yes. Yeah. So they put Montana in. Good. There. Yeah. Good. Um, but that. Um, I was in the bank the other day, and there was a young lady in there named Jill, and she was making out something, and she said, and when your, was your birthday? And I said, 8, 8, 24. Oh, my God, Cy. Said, uh, you're 89 years old. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> uh, uh, and she said at the time, what would you, what would you class being through life and being at 89 years old. And she said, would it be laughter as one of them? And I said, definitely. That, I think, is one of the main things in uh, your long longevity, they call it, uh, where enjoy life, as I was saying about going to work in the morning, uh, be happy, uh, and enjoy life and and the friends that you have throughout your life joy enjoy them to and your family and as i say friends in general amen to that thank you colonel i want to i want to bring up something now we we we've been laughing a lot you told a story on my show and i sat there and I didn't really hear it. I didn't hear it the first time, but I heard it the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth time that I played it back when I was editing. We have talked a lot about leadership today, but there was a point in your life where being a good leader impacted your crew in a way that I think is, is, is noteworthy here tonight or this afternoon. The first snow had fallen, the old crow is green, and your crew rallied behind you. You didn't have to say a word, you didn't even know they were doing this, but they sat out there and they polished that airplane to pure silver with no paint then or just the gasoline on their hands. That's pretty incredible. That's being a leader. What do you say to that? Well, uh, when it actually happened, I, I didn't realize that I, I, we had flown this mission over, over Germany when the snow came, and I looked at four airplanes against the snow. Two of them were camouflaged, dark, dark green, and two of them were silver. Well, which one stood out? Yeah. You know, the camo one. So my old crow was... Uh, um, dark green, my second tour airplane. And um, I got back and I thought, well, you know, I'd really rather have this thing in silver. I thought it was a little cooler paint scheme, too, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, easier to see, I though. I didn't let that snow. interfere my thing. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I explained to him and, uh, uh, that it uh, might be a tactical advantage for me to have a clean aluminum airplane in the wintertime. I put it on that basis. It might save my butt. And uh, these three guys, my former crew chief, which was a, he was a tech sergeant now and a line chief standing there. He always came back, handpicked a new crew chief for me and uh, my armor had been there all the time. And uh, they just kind of nodded. And I did say, well, when the thing is laid up for heavy maintenance, when it's gonna be down for a couple of days, would you please strip the paint off it and make it a silver airplane? And uh, I thought it'd take a couple of days at least to do that. Didn't think much about it. Uh, went into operation. I decided to fly the next day mm -hmm. and put my name on the board and, and uh, came out the next morning and I walked over the revetment and I looked down at this airplane 
and it's there in gloomy aluminum. And these three guys were standing there kind of at attention. And I looked at them for a minute and I felt like an ass, like a jerk. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I said, God, did these guys think I gave them a direct order to do that? Yeah. And I, it really bothered me, you know, and then I thought about it a little bit, and I said, no, you know, those guys wanted to do that. It was their, their part of the war, you know, they weren't doing the dying, and uh, they wanted to contribute. And uh, I just can't say enough about the crew chiefs of the world and the kind of support that we got um, in World War II. It was uh, really great. Thank you, buddy. I, w I want to bring up a picture. I want you to look at something. Rob, do we have that picture up? Colonel Anderson. You see those eyes? Those are the eyes of a warrior. We're going to use Bud as an example here because that's the picture we have up there. But when you look in these eyes today, you still see a shooter. You look in all three of these eyes, you still see warriors. And the common thread that runs through all of this is love. You loved your country. You loved your wives. Colonel Anderson, you've been married 68 years? Working on 68. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, you know Colonel Anderson goes all over these air shows. And you kept your wife at home for a lot of those years. She's been ill. And just recently, you had to put her in a nursing home. But you're still madly in love with her, aren't you? Sure. Yeah. See her every day, don't you? We do. I do. That's yeah. love. <laughs> we have to tell their stories. And you folks are the ones that are doing that. So that's up to all of us. Because we're not going to have these guys a whole lot longer. Time isn't on our side. So thank you for doing what you do. And they've entrusted their stories to all of us. And that's something we can all take home with us tonight. So thanks for being here. You can see all of these guys uh, at our sponsor's booth, John Clatt Air Shows and also Jackie B. But if you'd like to find out more about them, we have a way that you can get a hold of them right up here on this big screen. If you'd like to find out more about Colonel Anderson, you can visit his website, which is right up here. It's uh, To Fly and Fight is the name of his book, a memoir of a triple A Bud Anderson.com. If you'd like to find out uh, a little bit more about Colonel McGee over there, there's a good looking picture. That's, that's an F4 picture, I think, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Tuskegee Fun. Airman, an Air Force record holder by Charlene McGee, your, your, uh, your, your daughter. And uh, you can find the website right up there. Now, for Cy. Cy Campbell has a, a DVD down here. We, we told him he had two hours to write a book, but we prepared something. <laughs> Important for you. Both of these gentlemen accept cash on your website. You can mail a oh. payment <laughs> right here. There's a picture of Cy. You can mail your payments uh, to First National Bank of Montreal, Unity, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Attention, Jill, his favorite teller. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. If you enjoyed today, I'm Matt Jolly. If you didn't, I'm Rick Peterson. We'll see you next door. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Cy.